Imperial history is, to put it mildly, rather vague indeed, especially in the early years of the Great Crusade. Nowadays, misinformation and ignorance seem to be the order of the day for much of humanity's domain. Even the return of a Primarch hasn't changed that too much, I would wager. But there was a time when the people of the Imperium would, to an extent, be more privy to the events unfolding on the battlefields of the galaxy. The group assigned to chronicling these events did not exist for all that long, but their dissolution and disappearance could be said to be symbolic of the change in the Imperium. The age of information and hope was dead, and in its place came deceit, despair, and desperate defence against the darkness. Despite their relatively short existence officially, these individuals left many a mark on history, and just as they told the tales of the late Great Crusade, I will attempt to tell their tales in this log. They are known collectively as the Remembrancer or Remembrancer Order, or Remembrancers for short. This is Tactica Imperialis, and welcome to 40k Stories. The official origins of the Remembrancer Order come from the latter part of the Great Crusade, following the triumph at Ulanor and the ascension of Horus Lupercal to Warmaster. For the sake of posterity, on his withdrawal to Terra, the Emperor of Mankind commissioned the creation of the Order, a mix of artists, imagists, journalists and other similar professions. Their task was simple, record the history of the Imperium, particularly the Great Crusade that had now been passed to Horus to lead. Quite why this moment was chosen by the Emperor as opposed to, say, the beginning of the Crusade is slightly unclear. A possible argument is that this marked the transition in the operation of the Imperium from militaristic to civilian, passing the torch more from the Astartes toward regular humanity. The pre ulanor days were very much a military dictatorship for the Imperium. The Emperor and his war council effectively ran everything, and the focus was on expansion and conquering the galaxy. However, after Ulanor, the Council of Terror was created to be run by the Emperor. This was a much more civilian-led council, which consisted, I believe, entirely of humans, aside from the Emperor and possibly Malkador the Sigilite. Horus and his war council were still there, but they were a separate entity from the running of the Imperium, which was now handled by the Council of Terror. It is believed that the Emperor may have wished to remove the Astartes entirely after their use in the Great Crusade was done, which would also explain this transition as well. And though it's obviously not a direct link, it may be that human remembrances were introduced to the legions at this time as part of that. There is also a cynical view that would say that the remembrances were effectively planted by the Emperor since he was no longer overseeing the Great Crusade personally. They would be able to keep an eye on the Primarchs and their legions and their reports to the Imperial masses could be used to inform the Emperor in secret. Whatever the exact reasons are, they have, however, been lost to time. The Emperor isn't exactly that talkative nowadays. He's not going to be able to really give us an answer. Either way, following Ulanor, the Remembrancer Order joined the various armies of the Great Crusade. They were, in some ways, war correspondents. They actually went on the front lines to some extent, not just following up behind to witness the aftermath or keeping a safe distance in high orbit. Obviously, this was very dangerous, and I don't doubt that many a Remembrancer was killed, either by accident or on purpose, throughout the late Crusade. But it made sure that they captured as accurate a tale or image of the Crusade as possible. Unfortunately for them, their presence on those battlefields and front lines was not exactly popular amongst the soldiers actually doing the fighting. It is believed that, on the whole at least, neither the Imperialis Auxilia nor the Legionis Astartes were keen on the Remembrancers being on the front lines at all. Exactly why probably varied from individual to individual and commander to commander, but rather than being worried for their safety, it seemed as though a common complaint was that they basically got in the way. For example, Lehman Russ of the Space Wolves Legion is believed to have remarked that if a Remembrancer wanted to be on the front lines, they should be holding a gun and fighting as opposed to doing anything else. That said, there were those who defended and even welcomed the presence of the Remembrancers among the legions and armies of the Imperium. Again, reasons for this will vary. Some probably wanted their names or worlds to become famous by having their victories caught on camera, but others had different motives. 
The most famous of these would have to be Magnus the Red, the Primarch of the Thousand Sons Legion. The 15th Legion had been much maligned over the early years of the Crusade and were still mistrusted by many within the Imperium for their psychic abilities. Magnus hoped that exposure to the good the Legion and Psychers could do would be enough to start to change that opinion. After all, while some say all publicity is good publicity, there's something to be said for having the Imperial propaganda machine backing you up. As we saw with the Council of Nicaea later, it wasn't exactly successful, but I can understand the thinking behind Magnus's idea. However, for all their likely good work and presumed bravery, the Remembrancer Order was effectively dissolved at the beginning of the Horus Heresy. The Imperium issued the Edict of Dissolution, though none amongst the Order were actually aware of why this was the case. My best guess is that the continual broadcast of events involving interlegion warfare would have been completely unwanted by Imperial authorities. After all, as presumably it is today, the idea of treacherous or worse chaotic forces like Space Marines would be unthinkable and definitely not something you want to show your people. That would explain why the Order was stopped from operating, but if that were the case, why not tell the Remembrancers why they were doing it? I assume that it was to prevent the still loyal ones from knowing about chaos as well, or to stop them turning? I'm, I'm not sure. Whatever the case, it happened, but the plans for the Remembrancers did not stop there. An order was issued for the Chroniclers to return or be returned to Terra itself. This issue was actually brought up by the office of Malkador the Sigilite personally, who wished to debrief the Remembrancers when they made it home. Given this was in the now early days of the suppressive Imperium, I suspect that said debriefing would likely involve the extraction of all possible information followed by execution. Get all the intel on the legions, possibly helping to determine loyalty, before disposing of their unwitting agent to prevent any loose ends. Quite how many Remembrancers were able to reach Terra is unknown, but I suspect those who stuck with the Loyalist Legions did eventually. Admittedly, Malkador was dead by the time some Legions got home, and the Inquisition was barely beginning to form at this time, so like many things, these details are sadly lost. As for their records and the images they captured, they too are lost. I presume they were seized by the Imperium, or otherwise placed under an information quarantine. Their fate is unclear, no surprise, given the shadowy nature of the Inquisition and the lumbering bureaucratic juggernaut that is the Administratum. They may still exist in some forgotten or sealed archive somewhere, but they may have also been destroyed to prevent such information ever getting out. You might wonder why not sharing the early Imperium's greatest deeds is considered a good idea. It makes the Imperium look good, after all. But in the paranoid and stagnant age we've seen for millennia, it does make a measure of sense. For example, if you show a battle where a Primarch fought with their Legion of Astartes, you have to explain, assuming the audience even knows what a Space Marine is, what a Primarch is, what a Legion was, and why that Legion is now no longer known as a Legion, but rather as a chapter. Basically, information leads to questions, leads to corruption, or at least poses a risk of it in the mind of the Imperium. An inquisitive mind could wander down a dark path without meaning to, so keeping those minds closed is safer than selectively informing them. Despite this recall and information censor, this post of Remembrancer was at some point reinstated by Imperial authorities to broadly fill the role it had before, though why and when is sadly unknown. That said, there are some differences between the Crusade era ones and the ones we've seen since. Namely, A, we have no records of Remembrancers going onto live battlefields to record their tales and images, presumably because it's dangerous and it doesn't benefit the propaganda machine to see the grim truth of even the most glorious victories. How Remembrancers come to be appointed or deployed is unknown, since there doesn't seem to be a Remembrancer order anymore. I assume it's done by the Administratum or the Department of Munitorum specifically, but I'm not quite sure. Many a Remembrancer has risen to legendary status. Some names will potentially be recognised even in the modern Imperium. Perhaps the most famous of all is someone you could arguably call a living saint, though perhaps that isn't quite the right word to describe the saint, Euphrates Keeler. Keeler was an Imagist attached to Warmaster Horus' own 63rd Expeditionary Fleet, 
and she captured what I consider one of the most iconic images of the late Great Crusade. Garviel Logan taking his oath of moments in front of the Morneval with the banners of the 16th Legion in the background, if I recall correctly. Were it not for the betrayal of the Sons of Horus, I would wager that this would have become one of the most famous Astartes images of all time, but that was not to be. This image was taken before the final battle on the planet known as 6319, or as it is better known, Istvan III. Keela and the other Remembrances were deployed to the planet as well, as was the way of their order at the time, but on this occasion they were to be kept somewhat away from the main fighting under an Imperial Army escort. That plan didn't work, however, as Keela, the iterator, i.e. public speaker Kirill Sinderman, and other Remembrances managed to sneak away from said escort and get much closer to things. Unfortunately for them, they ran into something I doubt they'd ever encountered or possibly even heard of, a demon, specifically the Demon Prince of the Ruin Storm, known as Samus. All save Sinderman, who you may actually have recognised as one of the founders of the Inquisition, and Keela were killed, and it seems as though this incident had a profound effect on the Remembrancer. Perhaps due directly to the Samus business, or perhaps in concert with other unknown events or revelations, Keela would begin to convert the idea presented in Lorgas Lectisio Divinitatut, specifically the one that the Emperor was a god or otherwise a divine being. She would join a secret cult based around this idea, and she would prove perhaps both her faith in the idea and the idea itself sometime after the compliance of Istvan, but before the fall of Horus on his return to Davin. Sinderman had been attempting to research the Book of Lorgar, a massive tome penned by the Wordbearer's Primarch detailing some of the darker things he had encountered in his life. The iterator used the fragmented records of the Samus incident from Keeler and others to try and decode the information in the book, but in doing so, he accidentally summoned a demon onto the Sons of Horus flagship, the Vengeful Spirit. This demon began to ravage the ship's archives, but Keeler was able to not only stand up to it, but somehow banish it too before it caused any more harm. Though the Silent Sisterhood would come to believe the Imagist was a latent psyker, there were many who were convinced she was either blessed by the Emperor's supposed divine power, or even that she was a prophet of the God Emperor himself. They referred to her as the Saint, though of course there were no Imperial Saints at the time, there was no Ecclesiarchy. Keeler could neither confirm nor deny this at the time, as the effort of banishing this demon caused her to fall into a catatonic coma until around the time of the return to Istvan III after Horus's fall. And when she awoke, Keeler seemed to already be aware that things were awry. Maybe her subconscious was aware of attempts made by Horus's agents to assassinate her, maybe the God Emperor himself was warning her, but she knew something was off. Speaking with the Sons of Horus Captain Iacton Cruz around the time of the betrayal on Istvan and witnessing the virus bombing of the planet, Keeler joined Sinderman, Cruz and others in attempting to flee the 63rd Expeditionary Fleet. This little group were able to make their way from the Vengeful Spirit to the Death Guard frigate the Eisenstein, commanded by the Captain Nathaniel Garrow. The Eisenstein then made its legendary flight from Istvan, dealing with the first Plague Marines and ejected warp cores in order to survive. Keeler and Garrow also spoke at some length whilst they were both aboard the frigate, with Keeler at least somewhat converting the captain to the idea of the Emperor's divinity, but after the Eisenstein was rescued by Rogal Dawn and brought to Luna, Keeler was arrested and or interrogated by the Sisters of Silence in connection with potential psychic abilities. Though none know truly what happened to her during this time, she was either released by the Sisterhood or by the office of Malkador the Sigilite. I assume the former is true in at least somewhat, definitely more so than the latter, as following his ascension to the rank of Knight Errant, Nathaniel Garrow would seek the Remembrancer turned preacher Keela out. The Saint had been on terror whilst Garrow was taken in by Malkador's office, spreading the word of the Lectisio Divinitatus and seemingly winning a lot of support as she went. Garrow was searching for Keeler in order to find answers, though to what questions exactly I am unsure, but he wasn't the only one hunting for her. A corrupted assassin had been dispatched by Horus to try and kill Keeler, with the goal of spreading mass panic through religious disruption on terror. This race brought them to presumably a sermon given by Keeler, with the assassin attempting to assassinate the saint by sniper, and then, when that failed, up close. 
Fortunately for Keela, Garrow intervened and saved her. But during this battle, she proved that she was no slouch either, even if she wasn't quite on the level of an assassin or an Astartes. Her abilities don't seem consistent with a single psychic discipline, but during the fight she was able to heal injuries, share prophetic vengeance, and even stop time. Pretty impressive if I'm honest with you, though I don't want to speculate as to the source of her power. Following this, Malkador's office finally did take Keela into custody. What happened to her then is as unknown as what happened with the Silent Sisterhood, at least for now. Whilst it is believed that records of the Siege of Terror period, something she probably survived, will hopefully come to light as time goes by, it is known that the name of Euphrati Keela was not forgotten, even if the Imperium wanted the heresy to be erased from history. A comet she photographed in the Great Crusade was named after her, but the Keela comet would unfortunately become somewhat corrupted over the time, guiding a Cornate Crusade in its wake before it was destroyed by the Legion of the Damned. And when the cult of the Lecticio Divinitatus rose to become the Adeptus Ministorum, the nickname she received aboard the Vengeful Spirit stuck. The Remembranza was now officially Saint Euphrati Keela, Prophet of the Emperor, perhaps the first ever consecrated Imperial Saint within the Ecclesiarchy. I mentioned earlier that the Thousand Sons Legion were particularly in favour of Remembrances. 42 were in fact sent alongside the 15th Legion, with some being psychers whether they knew it or not at the time. A pair of these psychic remembrances assigned to Magnus's 28th Expedition Fleet were Callista Eris and Lemuel Gormon, both of whom were fast friends. Eris was what is known as a historiographer, i.e. someone who studied historical documents, but her abilities were more concerned with the future than her studies of the past. She could see visions of the future, often while suffering extreme migraines, though they were more sensations of coming events as opposed to properly seeing things. She was perhaps the first human to know anything of the coming burning of Prospero at the start of the Horus Heresy, as during the compliance action on Agaru alongside some space wolves, the Remembrancer saw flashes that convinced her of the invasion that would come many years later. Admittedly, what she saw must have been pretty vague, as no one seemed to truly know what she meant until Lieben Russ and his fleet were already hanging over the 15th's home. And as it so happened, Callista Eris would not even live long enough to see her vision come to pass. Presumably after his failed attempts to prevent Horus's corruption on Davin, Magnus asked Chief Librarian Arzek Ahriman and others to try and harness Eris's power. The plan was to try and gain a further insight into the Horus heresy that had yet to begin, but the plan failed. Eris had been kept in a warp nullifier after suffering a major seizure, and despite the technology and power of the Thousand Sons around her, she died horribly after being removed from the device. Her final vision is one of the suggestions that the Blood Ravens are somehow descended from the Thousand Sons, but even after her death, her story wasn't quite done. It seems as though she was able to communicate from beyond the grave with a human lover she had in the Prosperan Guard Imperial Army Regiment, and this communique brought her ashes into the hands of Lemuel Gormon, another Remembrancer whose psychic power seemed to be as yet untapped. It is believed that the societal behaviorist could read auras, and he was actually trained somewhat by Ahriman despite his reservations on psychers in general but how he came to be a part of the Thousand Suns' forces is a little jarring with the believed chain of events concerning the Remembrancers. Gormon, or Gaumon I suppose, personally requested to join the Thousand Suns when he became a Remembrancer, hoping that their powers could be studied in an attempt to resurrect his wife who had died whilst he was on terror. I doubt he really got that wish, but what confuses me is the fact that Gaumon is said to have accompanied the Thousand Suns to Ulanor. Since he only joined the 15th as a Remembrancer, this doesn't tally with the idea with the Order being created at Eleanor as opposed to before. The Logs might have just used some dodgy wording somewhere, and we know Imperial history is a mess, but it is a little confusing to try and get the timeline with him in order. Maybe there were Remembrancers that existed before the Order officially existed? I don't know. After the death of Eris before the burning of Prospero, her ashes were brought to Gaumont as I mentioned before but Eris had managed to speak to her friend and colleague between her vision of Prospero's fall and her eventual death. 
Gamon took the warning and attempted to flee Prospero with Eris's ashes alongside a few other civilians, sneaking onto a mass conveyor that was departing the system anyway. Unfortunately, they were just too late to make a clean getaway as the Space Wolves and the combined Sentia fleet arrived in system. Their vessel was intercepted by Russ's flagship, the Herafnacle, and its passengers were taken prisoner by the Silent Sisterhood for five years. However, this imprisonment would be ended by a raid from the post-Prospero Thousand Sons who were seeking a shard of Magnus. This caused Gowan to be separated from Eris's ashes whilst he was taken by the knight errant Dio Promus. That said, there would be some reunion later after Gaumon was made into a demon host for another shard of Magnus. Promus and the Space Wolves had gone to Argaru in search of that shard, but when they were unable to beat it, the Thousand Sun Sorcerer accompanying them bound the shard to the Remembrance instead. The combined force then travelled back to Nikea, where Librarian Araman was waiting assumedly without their knowledge. Araman used his abilities to extract this shard from Gaumon despite its seemingly overwhelming power, and it and the other shards he had gathered were used to restore Magnus somewhat. It is presumed that the raid by the Thousand Sons on the Silent Sisterhood prison had recovered the urn with Eris's ashes, as it was revealed that a shard had somehow become hidden in the urn after Magnus had been shattered following his defeat by Russ. Why? No idea, but it was there. As for Gaumon himself, he somehow wasn't executed or anything like that, but being possessed by what was, in essence, a demonic entity. According to the rune priest Bodvar Bjarki, who killed Dio Promus for killing loyalists sometime in his past, Galman had become what is known as a weird wraith for surviving the excision of the demon, meaning he would be immune to possession in the future. Obviously, this proved to be enough for Malkador and the Knights Errant to not only spare Galmon, but keep him in a prominent place as well, as he would become incredibly powerful under his newly assumed name of Promius, in honour of Promus, naturally. Promius, like Kirill Sindeman, would go on to found the Inquisition, but unlike Sindeman, he fell into the category of Inquisitor who believed the Emperor could actually be resurrected. His beliefs became much of the basis for Thorian Inquisitors that still operate today, and it is implied through this and his experience with demons that Gaumon slash Promius may actually have been a member of the shadowy secret society that I believe is known as the Illuminati. This group supposedly, if everything I've heard is true, operated and continues somehow to work outside of the Emperor's knowledge, and seeks to gather the quote-unquote children of the Lord of Mankind known as the Sensei in an attempt to resurrect him. I cannot link Promius to them in any concrete manner, but it would make sense if you take his beliefs and his experiences into account. There were other Remembrances who were assigned to the Thousand Sons and who later fled with Gaumon after Eris's warning. Camille Shivani was a close friend to both and was captured and rescued alongside Gaumon, though her fate is unknown. But during her time studying the history of Prospero beforehand, she fell foul of the warp entities the Psychnuine, who sensed her psychic power and she only survived thanks to the Thousand Sons. The other one that we know of, I know there's 38 more, was one known as Mahavastu Kalimachus, Magnus the Red's personal scribe and the actual author of the legendary Book of Magnus. He fled along with his works after realising he didn't remember some of the things he'd written in there, and though he was with the other Remembrances when they left Prospero, they were later separated and never crossed paths again. The scribe seemed to plead for clemency from either Malkador or the Inquisition later on, offering the study of the dictated works in his possession as well as their guardianship. The moon of Apollonia was chosen to be this place, and Callimachus' Athenaeum, compiled of his memories and notes, effectively became a second copy of the Book of Magnus, and a cult of guardians rose up on the moon to guard and study it even long after the Remembrance's natural death. Unfortunately, sometime after the casting of his rubric, Chief Librarian Araman would raid and plunder the Athenaeum for his own ends, before destroying the library and its contents so that only he had the knowledge of Callimachus and thus of his Primarch. There are many other famous remembrances, so let's cover a couple quickly before we complete this log. 
The first I wish to address is Solomon Voss, known to himself at least as the last Remembrancer. We are unsure to which legion or expedition fleet Voss was attached in the Great Crusade, but he had written more than his fair share of famous tomes and was regarded by some as the finest wordsmith of the age. Whatever his true allegiance is, Voss and some of his companions defied the Edict of Dissolution issued after Istvan III, instead continuing to document events and travelling to Istvan V to investigate. Of course, as we know, the traitor legions were mustering there, and the Remembrans and his colleagues were unfortunately captured. All were slain on the orders of Horus save for Voss, as the War Master bade him continue his work as a Remembrancer, but for the traitors instead of the Imperium. Unlike many mortal servants of Chaos, Voss was unharmed and unimpeded in this task. Whether he pitched the tales and events neutrally or in Horus' favour is unclear, as all his works were destroyed, but he stayed with the War Master's forces for at least some period of time. He himself suspected that he had gone insane, even if only for a bit, but he was no blind servant of the Ruinous Powers given what happened when he fell back into an Imperial Hand. At some point in the heresy, a mysterious ship entered the Sol system, itself being assaulted by the Imperial Fists, who found Voss aboard. The Remembrancer was taken to Saturn's moon of Titan, the most secure prison in the Imperium at the time, and now the home of the Grey Knights, where Voss was interrogated by the Primarch Rogal Dawn and by Acton Cruz, who now worked under Malkador. The trio spoke and argued at length, with Voss stating that the Age of Enlightenment was dead and the tyranny of the Imperium had begun, and if we're honest, he wasn't wrong. Despite Dawn's protestations, Voss raised a valid counter. If this Age of Information was still alive, why not publish what had been written whilst he was at Horus' side? Eventually, Cruz's pragmatism carried sway and Dawn executed Voss before having those writings burned, so sadly, we'll never know what they contained. Next is Mercedes Aliton, a documentarist with a perfect memory and the ability to record her memories thanks to implants. She joined the fleets after the initial pacification of Istvan III, along with Euphrati Kila and Carol Sinderman, who were already there, and though she never converted to Leticio Divinitatis, she was close friends with Kila. She was among the contingent rescued by Yakton Cruz and brought to the Eisenstein, and following their rescue by Rogal Dawn, these implants probably saved Garrow and everyone else aboard from execution by replaying the events of Horus's and everyone else's betrayal. Presumably after they arrived on Luna, Aliton was taken to Titan just as Voss would be later, though this was not revealed to basically anybody. After all, when Luna Wolf turned knight errant Garviel Loken was told by Yakton Cruz that Aliton wished to speak with him, he was completely shocked as Cruz had previously been adamant that Mercedes was dead. The two had become somewhat close during their time in the 63rd Fleet, and their reunion, whilst neither could really articulate it, seemed to have a vibe of one between lovers rather than anything else. It's, it's a bit of a weird one. Loken promised to have Aliton released, but her presence on the Vengeful Spirit was enough for her to know that she would never be released despite not having her implants anymore, so she wasn't really that useful. The revelation nearly got Cruz killed by the enraged Loken, but the intervention of Mace of Aaron and Tylos Rubio kept him alive, and it is presumed that, at some point, Aliton died on Titan. Finally, let's give a mention to one of the newest of the Remembrancers, even in the modern era. This guy doesn't seem to have any implants or abilities that I'm aware of, and until recently, I doubt he had any interest in taking up such a position. His name is Lev Tiron, and at the time of the 13th Black Crusade and the events known as the Gathering Storm, he was the Chancellor for the Senatorum Imperialis, not technically a high Lord tier position, but still pretty damn influential. He was the first of the Adeptus Terra to meet with the resurrected Primarch Robert Gilliman after the Battle of Luna and the Primarch's arrival on Terra afterward. Around this time, the Lex Imperialis was being reviewed to allow the Adeptus Custodes to leave Terra and wage war across the galaxy once more. Though it had opponents, including Captain General Trajan Valoris, Tyron was one of the loudest voices in calling for the change, which eventually was passed into law. 
His change in post from Chancellor to Remembrancer came after the Battle of Lion's Gate, known informally as the Second Battle of Terror, where Khorne chucked his forces at the Imperial Palace and lost. Admittedly, this was mainly thanks to Gilliam and Custodes and both Old and New Astartes being present, and it was after that that Gilliman appointed Tyrion as his personal remembrancer before launching the Indomitus Crusade. Assumedly, Tyrion has been recording the Lord Commander's observations and the battles of the Crusade as part of the Codex Imperialis, Gilliman's reforms to the Imperial system that is also expected to include a complete Imperial history. Unfortunately, I don't have access to any of those works, I assume there's probably only one copy, but I would be curious to read them in future to see how much they reveal of Gilliman's true opinion on things, uh, assuming that the rough notes are completely uncensored and then the one that goes to the public is a little bit more suitable for imperial taste, shall we say. And there you have it, an insight into the Remembrancer order and some of the most famous Remembrancers. These individuals have all played vital roles, especially in the Horus Heresy era, opening eyes to the truth, winning minds to a cause, or harnessing powers both innate and provided to great effect. They may not have won the same fame and infamy of some Astartes, but their deeds and the consequences of their deeds have been huge. The Ecclesiarchy may well have had its foundations laid out, the Inquisition was created by some of them, and many more. Though Remembrancers do not wield the power and influence today that they once had, their presence, especially in the newer, perhaps more open Imperium, cannot be underestimated. After all, they write stuff down, I have things I can learn about. But, for now, we must move on. Now, next time, hmm, what to cover? Actually, I have an idea. I don't like the idea, but it's an idea. This is going to be a dangerous little run, but I think it's only right to cover the group in question. Let's just hope I don't end up in their arenas as I try and get the information. For now though, thank you for watching Tactica Imperialis, and I'll see you all again. Goodbye.